So I'm Mikey. I mostly work on Calc and a little bit on i 18 and I'm employed by Red Hat. Um, so you still give me some time to work on this, even if not necessarily official, but well, I find some time. Hello, I'm Candy. I work for Colbora, and in the SCI, I'm representing mostly the online stuff. I'm Stefan, Red Hat, Plumbing. Quella <laughs> <laughs> uh, McMara, Red Hat as well, and I go with uh, GNOME integration. Yes, I, I guess I'm Michael Meeks, and I represent the forces of darkness. So <laughs> no, I don't know. All sorts of uh, different technical things. Uh, Christian, you want to? Yeah, I'm Christian Lohmeyer or Kloff, and uh, I'm doing the release builds, the release engineering, and that's why I have a seat on the ESC. I can use this. Hello. <laughs> this way. Hello, I'm Miklo Schweiner. Um, I'm very bad at updating minutes, as you see, um, and otherwise, usually, I'm doing writer things and whatever else is necessary. Why is there more people in the room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm Olivier. I'm Olivier. I am with uh, documentation. Um, Lionel, um, I work a bit uh, on base in my free time. I'm Gabriel, uh, a representative from One and One, uh, just for a month, I think, member of this committee. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Michael W. from the city of Munich. I'm not really representing one specific topic. Hey there, I'm Thorsten. I uh, work for CIB. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much on everything that nobody else wants to work on. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Cisco. Uh, I work for TDF and I represent uh, quality assurance in the ESC meeting. Um, Heiko from TDF, and I'm here in the ESC for USA user experience. Cool. So we run a call every week, I guess, and um, it's really very open for people to turn up or not turn up. And plenty of people take that opportunity to not turn up, so that's, that's great. And um, we, we uh, write some minutes uh, at the end, and it's just really, I guess, the heartbeat or the rhythm of you know, some of the engineering that has to be done. Um, and we just check in, compare notes, and see, see where everyone's at, uh, and communicate, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, everyone is welcome to join, if they so wish. Uh, do, you want to go, do you want to go through things? Miklos, is there a... Sure. So perhaps we can explain yeah, the uh, mystifying sections in the minutes you never yeah. understood. Uh, so, um, regarding the... Is this visible? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, we have this funding action item for Sophie to check with it a little bit. With the LibreOffice conference request wiki page, I guess that's either done or no longer interesting, or we don't have Sophie. Or perhaps all three at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and from last week, uh, there was this action item to backport that um, patch that was the result of the discussion of the, regarding the eSQLDB slash Firebird migration. Uh, Cisco, did you do that? Yeah, I can answer. So it has been done, yeah, it yeah. has been backported. Great, thanks. Um, then we would have the release engineering update. So if you are walking away. <laughs> I know the uh, status is that the 6.3.2 uh, RC1 is uh, on uh, mirrors currently, and the tagging for the 6.3.2 RC2 is going to happen uh, the week after the conference. So probably uh, next Wednesday. And the 628 RC1 is uh, the week after that, the last week uh, of September, basically. And yeah, now we are also getting closer to the 64 Alpha, which is uh, mid-October. 
So yeah, if you have experimental stuff, then now is the time to get it integrated, to have enough time to polish it for the alpha and yeah, just not delay your major stuff. What was the 3.6 stuff? Uh, the 632 RC2 will be tagged uh, next week. May I remind you on the uh, release plan? 6.4 release plan is not online. It is online. It is has it been now? since uh, two or three weeks. Okay, sorry. In that case, thanks. <laughs> uh, do you want to say anything about the remotes or the Android VR? Yeah, I know uh, Ral uh, mentioned uh, yesterday to me that the Android VR master build, the ARM based one, uh, crashes on every file operation. So something needs to be tracked down why it crashes. But yeah, apart from that, well, no updates. Um, and anything with this uh, new requirement to have a 64-bit uh, version? Yeah, I have a patch working to uh, build a 64-bit version, but uh, the external, the NSS uh, build needs some t uh, tweaks and yeah. But it's in progress. Okay, thanks. Um, what else? Uh, I don't have any online updates um, regarding the daily builds. Um, uh, any news with the Windows or the Mac OS? Yeah, there has been some outage of the free desktop or Anon JIT service. So uh, some uh, Tinder boxes didn't build during the time frame. Uh, as of far as I know, it's back online again, so builds should be available for all platforms. And Torsten also uh, uh, restarted his own Windows uh, Tinderbox, so there's another source for, for Windows daily builds again. That, that also provides daily builds? Uh, yeah, when it finishes, it does. There was, there was an issue with the, with the JDK uh, uh, JRE update. Um, it's not, but it's now hitting odd UI test problems, like every other build is failing there. Um, and I think the signing thing, that's also a bit of an issue. I don't know, is that something you can fix or? Yeah, I fixed the signing thing. Okay, Basically, so I changed the signing operations to better allow for signing with a private key on a smart key on a crypto device, so you don't have to enter the key so many times but I uh, used a variable that is set to an explicit false and set to empty like other variables and this broke the packaging on the Windows build, but this should also be fixed right now. Let me check. So if it's succeeding then, uh, and no UI test is failing, then it should actually upload something. Are there other um, Git mirrors that are hot of our Garrett. I mean, is there a GitLab or a GitHub? Uh, or a we have an <coughs> active replication to GitHub, uh, to Launchpad, and to, to Free Desktop. Okay. So if Free Desktop starts to flake, we can encourage people to migrate to something better, potentially? Or yeah, yeah. Or they can also just use uh, Garrett. Uh, it's also accessible without authentication. Okay. Um. Any, any other comments regarding release engineering? If not, then we would have the documentation update. Olivier, do you want to share us with something? Uh, this week on the maintenance and um, uh, updates in terms of translation for the online version on master, and 6.3. Uh, no uh, f more developments for the new help, but not yet ready. And uh, on the guides, it's still started. Uh, Google season of docs, but we have uh, some work already started by the technical writer and um, uh, with the outline of the document. So it's progressing on time. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, any questions to Olivier? 
If not, then we will do you the UX update. Heiko, are you? Ah, you are here. Great. Yeah, thanks. We have a long list of contributions, contributors, uh, numbers of tickets that require input from the user experience or design perspective. And what I do uh, every week is to uh, copy all the new tickets just to uh, draw a bit of attention on what people are interested in. I pull the data out of the RSS feed. That means it's not only new tickets that are listed here, but also tickets from the past that get a flag needs UX. And since I'm re really badly prepared, I don't have the list for this week. So um, UX is on hold. What I did here is to put in two examples from the, that's the latest two tickets that have, have this flag. And uh, usually I highlight uh, things that are interesting from my perspective that I think it's uh, something worth to consider in a larger scale. If it's a um, crazy idea or if it concerns just uh, uh, visual uh, changes, I don't highlight it. So sometimes it's uh, nothing and uh, I have no idea what has been, uh, was, what came in this week. Okay, thanks. Um, any questions to Heiko? Um, so then we would have the crash reporting section. This is on. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything particularly up to date this week. Um, I launched the uh, crash testing script, but um, I can't um, uh, SSH in to see if um, it's still in progress or if it has failed. So the numbers are the same there as last week. Um, two input failures, two export failures. Uh, they're right? better numbers. I have seen better numbers. I've seen all zero, but I think it's fairly uh, random how that happens. Um, Caverity is at 35, which is the same as it was last week, uh, so no great change there. And the Google fuzzing hasn't found anything at all this week. What's new this week then is that I've announced the two latest CVEs, uh, 2019, 2854 and 2855, which gives us eight. Uh, CVs uh, that we have had um, since we became a CV numbering authority. Um, they asked us initially how many CVs we'd need and um, seeing as we only ever used two previously, I felt it was foolish to ask for two, so I decided to ask for ten and it looks like we're going to have to go back and ask for uh, another block of ten. Um, with these most recent round of CVs there are fixes for our previous efforts, which in themselves were fixes for previous efforts. Uh, so additionally in the latest releases we've changed um, the behavior of the core issue, which is these scripts that can be run without prompting the user that they're being run, are being changed to be covered by the same uh, macro security handling that we do for ordinary macros. So any documents that, hopefully documents that contain calls to these scripts will themselves be flagged as containing macros, even though the macros that they refer to are actually the pre-installed ones. So they'll fall underneath the same macro security, which will hopefully give us an extra uh, layer of protection there. So even if we have failed yet again to uh, block these issues, then either way we should fall back to the next layer, which is that this document is an untrusted document and could do anything. Um, are you sure you want to do that? So hopefully that will bring this uh, saga to an end. And uh, that's what I've got. OK, uh, thanks. Um, then we would have the crash reporting uh, section. Uh, Cisco, is there anything unusual that uh, you would like to point out, or? That's what I, what I said last week. Hello. Uh, what I said last week uh, in 6.3.0, we had many crashes related to the dynamic number of columns uh, worked on by Noel. It seems it's fixed now in 6.3.1. Uh, at least first week, the numbers are much better. So we have 800 uh, crashes, while in 6.3.0, we had the first week 2,000 crashes. So we are getting better, better there.
Uh, okay, thanks. Um, we still don't have Sophie, right? Okay. Uh, so we normally have a section for hackfast and events and uh, trying to discuss um, how to distribute people so that um, there is always at least one or two mentors on each event. Um, so I think Torsten knows about the uh, Google Mentor Summit hackfest. Ah, indeed. Oh. You want to say anything about that? Um, yeah, maybe again the call for um, or the invitation to participate uh, at the potential Munich Hackfest. There's a helpful link um, in the minutes. Um, if you click on that, you find a registration table. And if you would be at all interested in potentially coming, there's no, there's, there's no, it's no commitment from your side, but so that we can gauge the interest and uh, either hold the event or not. Um, putting your name there, that would be really quite great. Um, if you could do that by the end of the week, that would be even better um, as well with a bit of lead time. Also, we're pondering perhaps to do some hacks, Hackfest NG, which requires some mentoring um, on site and it has a bit of a lead time there. So I would think probably everything below 10 people doesn't make that much sense. So that would be my, my, my aim to get to 10 by the end of the week. And it looks like for the moment that's probably going to be before the uh, Mentor Summit. Um, that would be 17, 18 of October. Um, b b uh, this date? So the, the summit is on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. But is the 19th and 20th? Exactly. Uh -huh. So 17, 18 would then be thir Thursday, fr Friday before mm. that, which sounds ideal. Uh, I don't know, Michael, can you can you make it? I uh, know I've got a corporate event then, unfortunately. So oh. me, Miklos, Kendi, Andres can't. But it's possible so, we can so, send someone. So neither before nor after? Uh, before I can't, after I have personally something, but others might be able to do it after. But I think there'll be a gap. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, so, so no harm. I mean, this was a bit of a crazy idea with the, um, and also there's quite a lot of other open source people um, in Munich at that time. Um, so from if we get some critical mass there, then perhaps making, doing some outreach and inviting other people over to fill the ranks. But it doesn't make sense if there's just two, two LibreOffice hackers there on site to do that, obviously. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, then we would have the GSOC section, where there will be a separate GSOC panel. Um, so just um, Torsten or Cisco or Heiko, you want to give us an update on, just in summary, where we are? Everything is done, finished, pencils down. So maybe then um, just a reminder that all the mentors, please, if uh, you don't have a student here, um, demoing the project, please send me some slides, me or Heiko, um, before tomorrow when we have the GSOC panel. Um, before tomorrow means today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's say I, I, need, um, I need some hour to paste it all together, so if you would give me that uh, much time, that would be appreciated. And then, of course, if your student is not here, it would be really quite helpful if you could then be on stage as a mentor and present the work. Otherwise, um, I'm not sure I, I would do justice or Heiko to the project. So, so I realized that there might be conflicts. Um, so of course, obviously then we'll find another way. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, then we would have the mentoring or easy hack update. Uh, this is actually uh, up to date uh, stats, which also uh, shows that uh, this week we did not have a first time contributor, um, but then we got double clap on the 
new contributor next week. Um, regarding commit access, anybody want to propose somebody to have commit access? Or not this week? So normally the way we do this is that in case there is somebody who does already quite a nice work and there is little value in forcing somebody to be reviewed for each and every commit for master, then um, he or she is proposed uh, in this meeting and then we discuss if there is anybody objecting. And if that's not the case, then we send some welcome mail to the developer and um, teach that actually this is this means that now it is necessary to take part of the review process and help out with reviews. Um, developer certification, I guess that's still sleeping for four more weeks. Um, Christian, any Jenkins or CI update? Uh, no, I, I didn't prepare any stats this week. But like more like if there is anything unusual uh, that that is worth noting. No, I don't think so. At least I, I'm not aware of any problems currently. Um, okay, uh, for the third time we don't have Sophie, so uh, let's keep the. Yeah, I can say that yeah, Weblight is in the in the public testing now and. I will have a talk on, on Friday morning at 10 o'clock, basically giving a summary and being there to basically summarize the feedback we have gotten so far. But the uh, short uh, summary is that we will likely switch to WebLate, uh, so there are no real blockers that were raised so far, so it seems to be the tool of choice going forward. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, there was this uh, topic uh, regarding the Fireburn migration from eSQL DB from last week, but that's um, apart from doing that backport that you already did Cisco, there is nothing to, to be discussed further there, right? Okay. Uh, so then we would have the QA update. Um, regarding most pressing bugs, this is meant to be up to date stats. So um, we. You did that? Yeah. Okay, so we did the work twice. Uh, but uh, the good news is that it matches what I pasted. So, um, it's good to have things reviewed. Um, so we don't have a new most pressing bug this week, which is great. Um, regarding other most pressing bugs, uh, the first one is has no name much to that. That's some um, macOS. Problem. Now, why, why is this tag this my class? So normally what we try to do is um, uh, review these uh, bugs and find out who might be a good person to look at that. Uh, given that it's probably serious enough that it needs some action. Um, um. Well, the, the problem we have here is that now in 6.3 we use Xcode 10 to build for Mac and it's giving uh, problems with uh, high resolution screens. Um, if you scroll up, you'll see that there are many duplicates already, so many users are uh, having this problem. Uh, then we did a build with Xcode 9, and the problem is not happening, but we cannot use that. Um, we cannot build with Xcode 9 because uh, Christian, well, uh, it's because of the uh, notarization feature, the additional signing stuff that Apple introduced and enforces for the new versions of macOS. Those require macOS 10. So while it might be possible to build the software with Xcode 9 and then do the signing with Xcode uh, 10, I don't want to mix and, uh, mix and match those tool chains, so I rather just want to build with Xcode 10. But unfortunately, I don't uh, have a a high DPI uh, monitor or Mac, 
so I cannot really reproduce the problem myself. Christian, um, the hardware budget for TDF for the year is underspent by several thousand euros. Yeah. Um, my suggestion would be that the board would approve something here, and it would be worth you having a high DPI screen. So. I, I don't know if other board members. Yeah, yeah, probably. yeah. I think we're probably quarrant here to have a board meeting and buy you a. a but high even having a high DPI screen wouldn't mean that I automatically knew where the problem lies. So that's it's that's just very true. But you, you want the change. So. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but at least I would have a. Uh, a you chance would at least have a high DPI it. screen, which would be nice. Yeah. So just to add, in 6.2 we had a similar problem. Uh, initially we build it with Xcode 10, and then uh, there were many crashes and hangs in on Mac. So then we decided to use Xcode 9. And then uh, Tomas uh, fixed those uh, crashes and hangs, but we still have this uh, remaining issue with high definition screens. Is there any hope that uh, the new toy chain will be a hard requirement for the App Store version and then um, whoever does the App Store version on Mac would be interested in looking into that? That's us. So, um, yes, it just depends how much time Quickie has and his managers can give him a way to fix stuff like that, which at the moment is not a lot, but... Okay, so in, in just to sum it up, uh, if uh, somebody has the needed hardware here and uh, could look into that, that would be great, otherwise sooner or later. And we should get Cloth to have a high res, a high DPI screen just to make test the builds because increasingly it behaves differently, I would thought. Hmm. Give him an action item. Yeah. Well, I don't think Maybe we I need to two. test it personally. There is people from QA team already up, uh, so I think verifying we, this issue. Yeah. So release engineering would traditionally smoke test something by running it to see if it runs. Um, <laughs> usually a good idea. Okay, um, and there are two more uh, bugs here, but at least there, there are some ideas uh, who, who could look into those, and those are not new. Um, then we have the new high severity bugs of the week. So uh, for these, um, if uh, it's something that's in your area, then it is worth having a look. Uh, for next week, I will try to do this uh, usual annotation where um, we can have some idea who would, uh, it would be a domain of what developer. Yeah, N normally we don't have uh, such a long list of high severity bugs. I normally double check that they are indeed uh, high severity bugs, but I didn't do it this week. So someone is uh, increasing the severity and uh, yeah, it needs a double check. Yeah, if you could double check if those are really high severity, that would be very much welcome. Um, okay, so that's um, about um, the high severity bugs, and uh, other than that, we only have the QA stats. So, um, is there any uh, top level topic that we would like to discuss here, or is there any question from the audience that uh, where you hope that there is an answer from the ESC, or any comments on the work we do, or? I thought Ash's question earlier was good, in, but much too generic. <laughs> I wanted to know what specific architectural problem. <clears throat> so, um, that's a very good question. I, I should elaborate. Uh, so the things that I have in mind, um, Take a concrete example, would be something like um, configuration uh, infrastructure, for example. I think it's, it's quite old, right? And it underwent some changes and some, um, it took some, some punching around, I guess, you know, during the years. And um, I don't think there is an expert that I know of who can 
um, explain it. Maybe you can. Okay, Stefan. Um, and, and and I'm not sure. This is one. This is just one example, and I can I can think of others. But, but let's pick just pick another because I think conflict's quite good. I mean, compared. But what do you think, Stefan? Yeah, it underwent a complete rewrite ten years or more than ten years ago, maybe. Um, but. Maybe it's just one part of, of the overall experience of what you mean with configuration. So, I'm not so, sure. so in my experience, it's still the too generic maybe to, to Fair enough. nail it down. For example, my, for me, the pain point is um, if I need to debug something, there, there is a, there is a, a whole um, uh, uh, mechanism that kicks in whenever you change something that triggers a config update, that the config update then would enable a feature or disable a feature, right? Um, and based on that, you would have UI items show up, like sidebar, something, an area that I worked um, quite a bit um, on. And it's almost, it's so opaque that it's almost impossible to trace it, to figure out essentially what changed here at runtime, maybe, depending on the config files that ultimately triggered the enablement of a feature or a UI element um, or something or another. And this whole thing happens um, because of you have the notification subscriptions and listeners that would update the config that then would trigger other listeners, right, including UI, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, the whole thing is almost impossible to mm. trace. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the on. layers atop the configuration. Yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. Was, that's mm. just one piece of the of the puzzle, probably. Right. Right. Yeah, that might be true. I'm not. I'm not. Right. And, and similarly, familiar with the with the layers above. So, so luckily, almost nothing changes in reaction to configuration keys changing. Right. There's all sorts of manual horrors to uh, to make these things actually have effect. Right. Uh, so it's, it's easy to imagine a world where you know you set the gconf key and then everyone reacts to the event listeners and makes them happen, but it's typically not the case in the code. Yeah, which is kind of sucky because when you want the demo, you want to do your LDAP. Okay, so LDAP doesn't have notification either, but you want to do some kind of change and then see all the machines go pow, pow, pow down the road as they as they change because demos are everything. You know? Right, and, and that's and not where we're at. Another good example would be the, um, some of the, um, the, the, the way we um, manage the UI um, and how, how we define them, all these. I mean, some of it, it seems to me that a review, I'm not, I'm not saying they're necessarily so bad that they need a rewrite, That's, that wasn't my point. My point is, um, how do we manage the problem of revisiting major features and components just to at least have a, a, you know, a core developer's um, um, op opinion and input as to whether there needs to be some, you know, major investment in improving that infrastructure because going forward it's becoming very costly to maintain or add features or, you know, we're spending a lot of time tracing um, bugs because it's just so opaque, no documentation, no code comments or minimal or misleading because they've changed. You, you know what I mean? My, my, my point that I'm trying to raise is how do we deal with the problem of having a very, very um, large piece of software um, that the expertise in the different areas is, is constantly changing, for lack of a better word. People leave, people come on board, and, and, and then they do touch parts and pieces, not necessarily understanding it fully, right, which is fine. Which is, we, we encourage that, right? Um, but ultimately, how do we deal with this problem so that going forward, we make sure that the, the project stays in a healthy um, a form so that when somebody new comes on board, is able or she's able to pick up and, and go on without spending months on end trying to wrap their head around something to make a change. Hmm. That's not hackish. That's not horribly hackish. <laughs> So, so my personal response would be that I guess we're doing quite well on, on that end and I don't think there's any, any money we can throw on anything that would improve things substantially in that regard. Um, so, it, it, I mean, we all know there's areas um, that are lacking um, maintenance um, and then if somebody comes up with a problem there, we collectively try to, to, to find out a way um, to do better there or to, to, to invest uh, energy into, into certain areas. Um, and sometimes it works to, to make a tender out of it. Um, other times somebody heroically finds the right idea to, 
to, to get things working again. Um, and then there's other areas that are more, more maintained. Um, so I think on a large scale overall, we're doing quite well and we're quite healthy, I, w I would say. So there's nothing that we would fear um, if something broke in some area that we would be totally helpless. I mean, we demonstrate that all the time that we together are able to, to address the, the issues that come in, um, even for areas that are under, under maintained for years. Um, and documentation, of course, but, but nobody writes documentation, and, and even if you throw money at that issue, I, I'm not convinced that what would come out of that would be any, any, any better than what we have. So if there's an issue, it's always, I, I, I think it's always this reactive uh, thing. If there is an issue cropping up somewhere, um, you start to ask around on, on IRC, on mailing lists in the ESC, what other people's opinion is there, and uh, if that's an area where we are lacking, then we try to, to build our, uh, our ideas around that and, and see how to fix the, the issues that do come up and not um, ours has proactively tried to, to lay the grounds for, for future contributors um, that would make it easier for them because that's always a, a thing that doesn't happen in reality anyway. So you, you, you do what you think needs to be done, but you don't cater for this uh, hypothetical um, newcomer um, that you want to handhold in some area. And, and yes, just... Just to add to that, like we have this, done this several times in the past, which was a mistake. So. <laughs> yes, so take the config manager case. It was a second system rewrite that we started with, and it was designed, heavily designed, and it was even documented. And all the modern technologies, 80 locks for every single key you took and not thread safe. You know, and, it, and so just simplifying it and focusing on the real need can really help. Really help. So. The other thing is that I think Chris Sherlock was trying to write some overview documentation, and I think that would be extremely helpful. So I think if you look at the Linux kernel, there are people who write books that explain, give you a map. And we have some pictures of the code that are helpful, but I think having, having the basic concepts written in a book might help if people still read books. I don't know. Um, so just uh, the, the classical answer to that question, I think, is, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's a cop-out, but uh, it's still uh, an answer. Uh, if you're dealing with like huge monster of legacy code that nobody understands, or that, that you find hard to, to find your way around with is start writing tests. And uh, whenever you discover an invariant or something that you um, reverse engineered, you reverse engineer to be maybe a design decision in the beginning. Uh, you can write a test for it. And uh, the good thing about tests is they are uh, documentation. And they are documentation that is that rots harder than uh, other documentation because it breaks if if uh, you break the software that makes uh, uh, breaks uh, the invariant that you have. So um, and that that can be incrementally uh, helping to get a grab of what this old thing is. Uh, once you want to kill it off and replace it with uh, something sane again. Um, so um, I was. Um one particular answer, so there was, a, there was this, um, I'm not saying you said that, but there's this idea, and, and Michael, you were also referring to that, that if you don't understand something, you need to rewrite that. The problem that comes from there is that unless you have not completely understood the problem, very likely the, the solution you're coming up with is either the same, same like, like as bad as the, the earlier one or worse, because you, you have to learn what the other person who implemented that already knew. So I'm not at all enthusiastic in, 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 in entering that sort of um, churn, especially because we are kind of under-resourced anyway. So we have much, usually much better things to do than preparing for the hypothetical. If, if you look at some of the, the larger refactorings we've done inside modules, they've been, I think, immensely successful. I mean, Quaylon's UI rework takes us to just such a, an immensely better place for 
well, let's not say it's a small part, but I mean, you know, widget layout and rendering, there's still plenty of problems in VCL that need fixing, um, you know, from rendering and drawing and things, but, but taken one part and made it nominally clean and much more beautiful, right? And, and all the calc core being rewritten or, you know, life cycle problems being fixed, it does happen. It's not. Uh, I, I do agree. If you, if you give me a, a minute to add a point that's very important. I think I completely agree with every, everybody's um, feedback. So let me clarify. I'm not suggesting that we rewrite parts that are hard to understand. That's absolutely not what I suggested. What I'm asking is, when do we know if a part of the system has become um, so messed up because of multiple hacks that maintaining it, making a change, is extremely costly, meaning you need to make a change. And the only sensible way to do it either is to change a lot or you break features or behaviors and change those test cases to adapt to the new behavior and potentially make a lot of users very, very angry at you. So how, I mean, this is, this is a little bit of a hypothetical problem. The examples that I've given are examples that I felt that there were too many hacks that changing it is almost impossible. You, you can't go around and change it because if the system is fragile enough, right? There is no clear way of doing it. And the next thing you have to do is invest a lot of time. How, how do we manage that? That's, that's, it's an open-ended question. I'm, I apologize. But otherwise, I agree with you. I wouldn't go around rewriting things. Um, any other comments to that, or probably we discussed that uh, to us now? So, so I think actually uh, we, we're relatively blessed with people who are experts in areas and also an understanding of who is expert in what area. <laughs> so that broadly we have reasonably minimal conflict and it's reasonably obvious what needs fixing and usually how. The only thing that's not obvious is how to fund any of it. Um, so, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Mike? Hello. Uh, my question is about uh, the situation, the question from uh, uh, possible uh, contributors uh, that I uh, face uh, very often. Uh, when they want to do a one-time contribution, for, for instance, fix some uh, Built on some uh, system, some uh, uh, operating system, for instance, uh, and they uh, struggle. Well, it's not too complicated, but uh, usually they complain that they are busy people already having uh, account at GitHub or something. Why do they need uh, another account? And they usually not only need one another account, but multiple. One for filing a bug at Bugzilla, one to uh, have uh, some access to uh, Garrett, and so on. Uh, my question is not that we should, uh, for instance, move to GitHub or something, but could we have at least, uh, at first uh, stage, uh, a single uh, sign-on sign -on to Bugzilla and uh, Garrett? and further possibly to have some uh, way to create a change from Bugzilla to uh, make it easier uh, for such uh, contributors to create a bug and then from there go, go, uh, create a uh, change, possibly using use, uh, web UI. It's often uh, desired uh, from my experience uh, when, talk, when talking with such uh, developers, uh, so, so that make it easier for them. So, uh, so for, for the first question, um, I hear there might be news on Friday on that. Hmm? So for your first question or the first suggestion, I hear there might be news on Friday on, on that topic. A uh, single sign-on is something that uh, Klaus and Gioham has been working on for a very long time, and as Thorsten uh, says, it's not yet finished. Uh, I think there is hope that in the 
in the near future <laughs> uh, that will come to an end and actually you can really just uh, register on the user document foundation org and, and uh, use that account everywhere. Yeah, and even without uh, having it in place already, you could already use your uh, GitHub account to log in to Garrett. You could also use your Google account to log in to Garrett, so you wouldn't have to create a completely new account for this. And if you want to not use Git checkout, you can create a change in Garrett web uh, interface and uh, don't have to yeah, use command line if you don't want to. So for simple fixes, uh, one-line fixes, you can create the change request from within Garrett Web UI. But yeah, as uh, Thorsten already mentioned, uh, the single sign-on system is uh, spread out over multiple uh, services on the TDF infrastructure already, and uh, Garrett will be the next one to be switched over, and then hopefully the problem Thanks. will be gone. Okay, so uh, the other thing is, um, while it is possible to create uh, garage changes just using the web UI, it's, uh, in my view, it's uh, relatively rare that that's the bottleneck. Usually it's not the building time or the, or the code writing time that's the bottleneck. It's, you spend most of your time reading existing code, and then it does not really matter if you, at the very end, you create the change locally, or it's actually helpful to create the change locally so that you can quickly test it, get some good uh, iteration, and once you are happy with that, you can upload that for review. And regarding the Baxilla integration, I also don't see how you would start the fix with your Baxilla ticket. So our integration works the other way around. When you create a change request and reference the bug ID, then there will be an automatic notification in the Baxilla ticket that the uh, commit has been committed. But if you have a concrete suggestion how we could uh, integrate it the other way around, yeah, please uh, talk to Guillermo and me or drop an email. I suspect as well that I, I, I guess that so I think right now the, the problem we rather have is on the review and mentoring and, and, and that side so opening some fire hose for people posting random changes to code from I don't, I don't know if that is really the, 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 the largest issue we have right now I, I agree the, the sign on thing is irritating and I wonder if I mean perhaps getting Getting signed up then is, is really just um, if people are already on Bugzilla, then there's nothing else they need to do. That would be my hope when this Garrett thing works. Because right now, even if you have a GitHub account, it's still a bit of clicking and registering and form filling. Yeah, just uh, one another thing. Uh, of course, like if you run into things that are like easier to done, uh, then like it takes time to actually contribute that. Uh, please do file uh, easy hacks for that because uh, like uh, I don't think that we have some good flow of easy hacks now. So if you find uh, things like this that can scale uh, to to other people, uh, that would be extremely appreciated. Yeah, and just a closing remark. Um, I think. Uh, the most troubling uh, uh, stuff for newcomers these days if they join the project is getting used to Garrett at all because they have never seen it before. And all the other stuff is probably easier. Um, but uh, so I think it's a valid point and we should revisit this regularly to just see um, if, if we move too far from the mainstream so that people are already uh, scared off by our tooling. Um, but uh, I don't think there's, there's an easy solution to that now. So, so you, uh, I think back in the day we discouraged people from sending emails with patches in them for some reason. But, but a long time ago, an email with a patch in it was the preferred means. And if anyone is scared or worried or put off, then just email the patch to Mike, who will help review it and get it into Garrett for you. <laughs> That's what I, mean, I suggest. In, in terms of um, uh, habitual workflows or muscle memory that people would be used to GitHub, um, so with both GNOME and KDE having migrated to GitLab, there will probably be a nice source of data on that, whether that changes contribution 
on their side. My, my, I don't know. So personally, I, I guess that's probably um, if you want to mask the liberal office, then Garrett is your, your, your smallest problem. Uh, but I might be wrong. I think we're coming up to the end of, of our slot on the beginning of Stefan's, which, uh, you know, I don't know, no, janitor of sanity, you know, so uh, uh, last, last thing's got a few more minutes, two, five, three, something like that. Yeah. Anything else? Otherwise so, we can do QA, QA gets relegated to the end, tragically. Um, Cisco, is there any, any? Well, I just <laughs> want to add a comment on that. Um, Bjorn mentioned Garrett. I think uh, now, especially young and newcomers, are not used to IRC, and that might be another thing that they are they might be afraid of. Um, I think, in that way, at least in communication way, nowadays other tools are used. I'm not. I don't have personally. I don't have anything against IRC, but that's something that maybe we should consider as well. So you can embed it in the web page. So as you're filing a bug, there's the Bugzilla you know, QA channel, you know, in an IRC widget on Bugzilla. You know, so you can ask Cisco, to, which button do I press? You know? yeah. yeah, could be. Um, do you want to say anything about the QA bug stats, Cisco? Or I don't know if, Miklos, if they're up to date. Mm. That, that's the only section which is not up to date. So at least uh, depending on that, please don't draw a different conclusion compared to last week. <laughs> well, no, I, I updated it. That well. Ah, OK. So do you, um, is there anything unusual that, uh, that is worth noticing? Well, to be honest, I normally don't uh, look at these uh, stats. I think they are just more uh, for information for yeah, people who uh, read. Probably the primary, um, at least one purpose of this is that there are these top lists, and if you are one of those top bug fixers, then finally somebody uh, writes your name there and you can be happy. <laughs> uh, fine, so I guess that would be the end of this ESC slot, unless anybody wants to talk about anything else. Uh, with, uh, Yes, see. No, nobody. No, this is done. Thanks for your attention.